So, applause stop before I arrived. I need to be quicker. <laughs> uh, nice to have you. Between you and today's party, there's the AfD power grab. It's not something great. I think we should talk about a government where the AfD is part of it. In the last couple of months, especially after the um, revelations of Collectif, a lot, we talked a lot about what AFD would do if they would grab power, if they were in power. And I think that's important, but I think the what we're talking about today are more sort of worst case scenario, but not necessarily looking at what we might be facing right now. If we're looking at what AFD is pl planning currently and how far along she is at the party is at many different um, federal lender, but also at the federal level, then we can see that it is really possible that the AFD might be part of a coalition. Um, at the communal level, we see that a lot of parties are actually voting with the AFD, that there is um, laws being introduced that are that have support of the AFD, and there's these kind of um, thought, thoughts, um, yeah, just thought reports by this CDU guy in Sachsen-Anhalt who are really saying, well, we should really get together and work together with AFD. And let's have a closer look at what a scenario like that could look like and what we can do when it's too late, because, spoiler, even if it's too late, it's not too late. So what do we do when someone like this woman is in the government? So let's first have a look at what a possible AFD government um, would look like. Uh, let's imagine a election evening where a lot of coalitions are possible. The CDU doesn't want it with the left party. Many small parties uh, are there, but you can't um, build a coalition with them. There's big chaos at the, in the end of the evening. The um, CDU head of uh, party says, well, our uh, responsibility is to not uh, let this country descend into chaos, so we'll um, to do a coalition with the AFD as a junior partner. We will not do many laws with them together. We will push through our own program and we will keep the AFD small. What could the AFD do in that situation? They could pick a few interesting ministries. They will try to get the interior minister. This is what NSDAP did back in the day. They can get a lot of other interesting ministries and using these ministries without even um, publishing new laws can push the boundaries of the existing laws and make um, our lives more difficult. What could they do, for example? For example, they could try to um, get a central pregnancy record with the health minister, so collecting data about all people who are pregnant and a central register to um, register that and make that um, uh, create a scenario of a threat for such people. That wouldn't be a much harder um, discrimination than already exists, but it would be crass. So then they could um, cut the funding of uh, pregnancy crisis centers. Um, such as centers that do um, abortion um, counseling. And uh, according to the current legislation, if you want to have an abortion, you have to have a counseling before, but if you can't find counseling, then no abortion. So that is what the AFD could do. What else could they do? They could, for example, 
um, cut preventative uh, funds, which we've seen with uh, last generation activists who uh, were taken into preventative custody, even though they did not um, commit a crime, uh, and they were still taken into custody. So you could assume that the AFD government could preventatively uh, put people into custody because, of course, um, they uh, could commit crimes against the AFD party meeting. And in this fashion, the AFD didn't, wouldn't even need to create new laws. They could just work with, already, um, with what we already have and make our lives more difficult. Now, where do I push? Here, there? All right. And the means, and I think the worst narrative that makes our lives difficult in this regard is the means and the narrative. Oh, yeah. That it isn't as bad as expected. And especially uh, this weekend with the um, district uh, administration elections in Thuringia, where the AFD was really, really strong, 20, 30 percent even in the runoff elections. And many people said, well, it isn't that bad because the scenarios we had, they're immediately going to win all of Thuringia was so big that people said, okay, well, it's not as bad as expected. It's, it's all right. And the same could happen with an AFD government before all of the um, bad things that could happen, there would be small steps, a small escalation where we would say, okay, well, that was bad, but it wasn't as bad as it could be. Well, now we've got deportations to Syria. Uh, well, now we've got deportations to Afghanistan, to Iran, but it's not as many as we thought, so it's not that bad, and we needn't uh, take the streets. And that, I think, in... Um, uh, with the, uh, the tail, you all know the frog in the hot water. If I put a frog into water, I don't think there's any biologists uh, here. Um, I'll probably say a lot of bullshit now, but yeah, if you put a, fr uh, a frog into water, uh, into hot water immediately, um, it would jump out. But if you put the frog into cold water and just slowly turn up the he heat, um, then the frog will um, stay in the water and die. And I can imagine that it would be similar with an AFD government that through normalization, through all the small steps to um, abolishing democracy, there would be a normalization effect and they could actually pull through their inhumane project. And there's historic predecessors, that is Sebastian Höfner, a historian who had a diary in 1933. He was at the uh, district court in Hamburg, and he watched the Nazis take over power. And he kept a detailed record of what the um, bourgeois citizens uh, thought about this and why there was no resistance after uh, 13th January 1933 where um, the NSDAP pushed into power. And it's very impressive in the book to see how this normalization went about and how people saw, well, okay, that's all bad, but it's not too bad. And in the district court where he worked, um, a few um, judges went over to the Nazi parties, but gradually one after the other. And well, no one wanted any disturbances, and it just went out without much ado. And we need to think about, and I think we need to prefer, prepare for the moment and prevent that this will happen again. And the first question in this context is, does that happen automatically? When AFD comes into power, 
um, will they automatically be able to do what they want to do because there's a step between um, planning something and actually implementing it. We know it from many other parties. They get into government. They have a lot of plans, and none of those really work out. And of course, that could also be the case with AFD. And then the question is, who is in charge of all of that? And that is um, authorities. Authorities have a lot of possibilities. In the case of an AFD government, they could just refuse orders. And uh, the most important keyword in this um, context is the right to demonstration. It, it wasn't in the public focus for a long time, but this right to demonstration is actually an obligation to demonstration because all public authorities in Germany have the duty to refuse um, unlawful orders. And um, in the context of an AFD government, that would mean if authorities are commanded to do something that is against uh, the law, they are actually not allowed to do that. Now, authorities aren't especially known as uh, very um, resistive, but they have all sworn an oath. And we have to ask ourselves now, what does this mean? We've had the um, 75 years of the basic law anniversary recently, and now we have to ask ourselves, isn't, is that just nice prose, nice celebrations, and the president speaking about the merits of the um, basic law, or do we actually look at the people who swore an oath to that basic law and um, could actually resist? And the, uh, on the layer below, there's an even more practical Oh, sorry, that should be a GIF, but yeah, it's it's even slower like that. So yeah, at, at some point he will press the stamp. And that's the um, so-called Bummelstreik. During research for my book, I heard a cool anecdote from the Interior Ministry. The uh, most uh, successful Bummelstreik in the Interior Ministry, Otto Schiele, wanted a maid. So <laughs> in the evening, he met up with um, certain uh, renowned gentlemen, and he wanted a maid to serve these men. And that's not a thing in German administration. And the um, authority in charge just didn't want to fulfill his bid. So um, yeah, he commanded that uh, inquiry to be forwarded to Department Z, which is the um, hardcore administration, basically. And they um, received the bid. And then they um, replied, well, uh, maids, we don't have that. Um, that's not in our salary structure. So it went back to the ministry. Um, and. They said, OK, we'll do it like this and that. And then it went, went back to um, Department Z. And then they said, OK, well, but if we get a maid, uh, this will concern um, food right. And there's this and that matter that's not uh, really clearly um, clear. And so it, the, the thing actually never happened. So this uh, means of Bummelstreik is really effective, but you need allies within the authority. And there's another solution, just call in sick. If you're working in an authority, uh, you can do that just not to partake in this shit. And so get out, get a sick note. Go see something nice. And that uh, can broaden your horizon, and um, that would be good for authorities. And um, to look into other societal areas, then there's um, unions for authorities, even though authorities can't strike, but they can get a sick note. Other, um, Parts of society have more experience, but less experience than other countries with strikes. We need to learn how to strike well again. And we can learn that from other countries. 
from Finland, for example, they have a lot of strikes. And we so far have a very restrictive strike right. For example, political strikes are forbidden and general strikes are forbidden. But if we imagine a situation where the AFD were to come into power with a program that would abolish democracy, I don't think it would be decisive whether a strike would be legal or illegal. But we would see which possibilities we have to um, put that into action. And I think unions have a um, particular challenge here to um, challenge the existing laws. What cases could we see where political strikes for democracy could uh, be handed through the instances? How could we find um, um, how, how could we build alliances? and bring groups together. I think um, Wir fahren zusammen is a good initiative from um, Fridays for Future and Verdi, where uh, the rights of um, people who work in um, public transport, as well as people who strike for the climate, come together. And I think this would be a good thing to use that as an example. The media, of course, also a huge topic. I don't need to talk a lot about how to disturb a talk show. I've done that on other channels, but I let me say this much. After the biggest democratic pro protests we had in January this year, in the big talk shows of this country, who was invited? Not the organizers of these strikes, but the people who make this inhumane politics. There's something really wrong with the talk show, with the whole system, you could say. <coughs> something very fundamental. And I think that it's really sort of a hit to the face of those people that are actually active on democracy. In these democracy demonstrations in January, we heard a lot of um, talks, a lot of speeches about everyone needs to get in line, everyone should sort of fight for democracy, and I think we should all s we should also see that in the talk shows. And we don't need, I don't need to know anything about what AFD thinks about um, people going to protest against it. I think it is really important to fight for um, free information. And I saw how many of the old investigative um, investigative reports that öffentlich rechtliche that the public broadcasters in Germany have really um, published but they needed to be depublicized and this depub and um, sort of this kind of um, deep publication of um, public broadcasting they need to depublicize some of their stuff um, that is a really bad policy because it leads to a lot of bad and um, against humans information being spread far and wide. Well, the good information is actually um, sort of really separate. Now, I don't have a subscription for every private media outlet. I can't afford it, but I would need that in order to read all of the investigative journals, investigative reports about far-right media. Now, let's be honest. I wouldn't take an, I wouldn't take out a subscription of Zeit Online, but I would be happy to pay Zeit Online to get a subscription to make sure that all investigative reports of Zeit Online um, about this kind of far-right um, democracy against these far-right um, things would actually be public. We can call this democracy flat. I think this can be something that has a future to pay for sort of making stuff publicly available. Now, this isn't the definitive list of five things that we can do. I don't think there is such a thing as a definitive list, but 
I think we all see that there is a need to do something. And I believe that we all feel that, and I believe that there can be power in that. And one really central idea that is really useful to sort of cope, cope with how to fight against IFD and how to strengthen democracy is this idea of rooms, of making space. How does, um, how does the AFD actually work? They are really, really successful at t taking over space at sort of taking this space and then also taking it over from democratic parts. We see this in rural areas where the IFD actually is very, very active, is taking space there. So it is important to go um, put up posters everywhere, even in rural, in rural areas as well. But of course, online, this is a similar thing. We have to think about how online we can create these kind of spaces that are democratic and open. And I think conferences like this are good. I think um, secure and open rooms are good. Rooms of trust, rooms that include trust, rooms where it is possible to discuss more controversial topics. So it's important that we can also talk about Gaza, for instance. Even though it's controversial, of course it's controversial, we need to create this kind of trust. We need to also discuss this on the big stages here. And I think it's, I think we also need to create physical spaces in our area that includes stickers wherever you live, that includes going to live, going to stay in these cultural centers or creating them. But this is the same in the digital space. And I think sometimes we're missing that. Um, writing in uh, Wikipedia is really a type of working for democracy. This is how we're creating space, creating digital spaces that are really important for democracy. I know it's annoying. It's annoying. I There's so many old white men as admins, and it's annoying to be to have to fight with them, but you have to do it. And I also realize making information accessible and how making information accessible on Wikipedia can actually um, sort of make a discussion more fact-based and better. And then it's also to do more democracy. And I think, yeah, some people say, yeah, this is, of course, self-evident. But I don't think it's self-evident because in many talks, whenever I'm talking about People always talk about, well, let's defend democracy, let's defend status quo. But I actually think we, we don't only need to defend democracy, but we need to fight for more democracy, not necessarily look at AFD and think of how can we make sure that they can't um, sort of become more prominent. But instead, we need to come up with our own visions, spread these visions. Um, so not only fight against press, against AFD, limiting press freedom and um, opin freedom of opinion, but also expanding press freedom, expanding freedom of opinion. And this is what we're doing with Frag den Staat, which is um, to sort of like make sure that we get fast information. And sometimes this kind of bureaucracy, they ask us, why are you uh, sort of um, suing us? Why aren't you suing IFD? But I think it is really, really important to make sure that um, this information becomes public. And this kind of democratic um, really discussion becomes a good foundation for making sure that AFD does not become um, an, a more important party. Then, of course, data privacy, data protection is a measure against the AFD. If we look at what kind of data they already have access to, then you can get really fearful um, via the um, local governments. They are able to actually control the bureaucracy. And we want local per parliaments to actually control bureaucracy. But through these, they can actually get um, information and 
uh, files on these kind of democratic in initiatives. And now we already have some d d democratic initiatives already have this problem of um, their files going to AFD. So if the state, if we manage to get the state to, sell, to get less data, um, to, to get less data, then AFD couldn't even get this data. So if you're active in a democracy initiative, go to a go to a melderregistersperre, which is basically that you can make sure that no one is able to get your files, is able to get your data from this register. Then the last point, the fourth point I'm getting to is um, donations. We had this um, this. We weren't able to spend any more money um, last year as a government um, after the basic court has made the decision. So a lot of us were really asking what to do. Um, some people who worked for the German parliament, some people who are actually part of the um, net, part of these kind of democracy networks, they we didn't know if they would have money in two weeks. So, um, of course, AFD doesn't want them to be funded. Now, this mean, what does this mean for us? For us, this means to donate more money to democracy initiatives. This also means that if you're um, if you're working in a, in a company, then you should also encourage your company to donate more. Um, now, personally, I'm donating one euro for every book to Polylux, which is donating initiatives in Eastern Germany. Um, and then the last thing is maybe prepping for the future. I think what we're actually trying to do is to prepare for the worst case. And prepping has a really, really bad reputation, and I understand there's good reasons for that, because we usually understand prepping as an individualistic thing. People take toilet paper, water, they um, try to become better shooters, better shots. And they really are preparing for the sort of um, fi for a physical fight of this kind of thing. This is a self-made thing for me. I'm talking about prepping for future. I created this myself. This is a, these are my Photoshop skills. They're not very good. Now this means we are actually um, sort of stocking up on solidarity, on love, on. Um, all of these issues to prepare for um, an election night where AFD actually wins. Who do I call? Who who do I to think right now about? Who would I get in touch with? Who would I ask, hey, are you fine? And whom do, who would I want to fight together with? Who would I want to be together with um, if AFD comes to power so that very quickly they're gone again? Thank you very much.